The Descent from the Cross, painted by Peter Paul Rubens between 1612 and 1614. From The Former Masters by Eugène Fromentin. I need not describe the composition. You could not mention a more popular composition as a work of art or as an example of religious style. There is nobody who has not in his mind the ordering and the effect of the picture. Its great central light cast against a dark background, its grandiose masses, its distinct and massive divisions. We know that Rubens got the first idea of it from Italy, and that he made no attempt to conceal the loan. The scene is powerful and grave. It acts on one from afar. It stands out strikingly upon a wall. It is serious, and enforces seriousness. When we remember the carnage with which the work of Rubens is crimsoned, the massacres, the executioners torturing, martyring and making their victims howl, we recognize that here we have a noble execution. Everything in it is restrained, concise and laconic, as in a page of holy writ. There are neither gesticulations, cries, horrors, nor too many tears. The virgin hardly breaks into a single sob, and the intense suffering of the drama is expressed by scarce gesture of inconsolable motherhood, a tearful face or red eyes. The Christ is one of the most elegant figures that Rubens ever imagined for the painting of a god. It possesses some peculiar, extended, pliant and almost tapering grace that gives it every natural delicacy and all the distinct of a beautiful academic study. It is subtly proportioned and in perfect taste. The drawing does not fall far short of the sentiment. You have not forgotten the effect of that large and slightly hip-shot body, with its small, thin and fine head slightly fallen to one side, so livid and so perfectly limpid in its pallor, neither shriveled nor drawn, and from which all suffering has disappeared. Recollect how heavily it hangs and how precious it is to support, in what a lifeless attitude it glides along the sudarium, with what agonized affection it is received by the outstretched hands and arms of the women. Is there anything more touching? One of his feet, livid and pierced, encounters at the foot of the cross the bare shoulder of Magdalene. It does not rest upon it, but grazes it. The contact is scarcely noticeable. We divine it rather than see it. It would have been profane to insist upon it. It would have been cruel not to have made us believe in it. All Rubens' furtive sensitiveness is in this imperceptible contract that says so many things, respects them all, and makes them affecting. The sinner is admirable. She is incontestably the best piece of work in the picture, the most delicate, the most personal, one of the best figures of women, moreover, that Rubens ever executed in his career that was so fertile in feminine creations. This delicious figure has its legend. How should it not have? its very perfection having become legendary. It is probable that this beautiful maiden with the black eyes, with the firm glance, with the clear-cut profile, is a portrait, and the portrait is that of Isabella Brandt, whom he had married two years before, and who had also sat for him for the virgin in the wing of the visitation. However, while observing her ample figure, powdered hair, and plump proportions, we reflect what must some day be the splendid and individual charms of that beautiful Helen Formant, whom he is to marry twenty years later. From his earliest to his latest years, one tenacious type seems to have taken up its abode in Rubens' heart. One fixed idea haunted his amorous and constant imagination. He delights in it. He completes it. He achieves it. To some extent, he pursues it in his two marriages, just as he never ceases to repeat it throughout his works. There is always something both of Isabella and of Helen in the women whom Rubens painted from either one of them. In the first, he puts a sort of preconceived trait of the second. Into the second glides a kind of ineffaceable memory of the first. At the date of which we treat, he possesses the first and is inspired by her. The other is not yet born, and still he divines her. The future already mingles with the present, the real with the ideal. As soon as the image appears, it has this double form. Not only is it exquisite, but not a feature is wanting. Does it not seem as if in thus fixing it from the first day, Rubens intended that neither he nor anyone else should forget it? As for the rest, this is the sole mundane grace with which he has embellished this austere picture, slightly monkish and absolutely evangelical in character. If by that is meant the gravity of sentiment and style, and if we remember the rigors that such a spirit must impose upon itself,
In that case, you will understand a great part of his reserve is as much the result of his Italian education as of the attention he gave to his subject. The canvas is somber, notwithstanding its highlights and the extraordinary whiteness of the winding sheet. In spite of its reliefs, the painting is flat. It is a picture of blackish grounds on which are disposed broad, strong lights of no gradations. The coloring is not very rich. It is full, well-sustained, and clearly calculated to be effective from a distance. It makes the picture, frames it, expresses its weakness and its strength, and makes no attempt to beautify it. It is composed of an almost black green, an absolute black, a rather heavy red, and a white. These four tones are placed side by side as frankly as is possible with four notes of such violence. The contact is brusque, and yet they do not suffer. In the great white, the corpse of Christ is drawn with a delicate and supple line, and modelled by its own reliefs without any effort of nuances, thanks to deviations of imperceptible values. No shining, no single division in the lights, and scarcely a detail in the dark parts. All that is of a singular breadth and rigidity. The outlines are narrow, the half-tints limited except in the Christ, where the underlayer of the ultramarine has worn through and today forms blemishes. The pigment is smooth, compact, flowing easily and thoughtfully. At the distance from which we examine it, the work of the hand disappears, but it is easy to guess that it is excellent and directed with full confidence by a mind broken into good habits that conforms to them, applies itself, and wishes to do well. Rubens remembers, observes, restrains himself, possesses all his forces, subordinates them, and only half makes use of them. In spite of these drawbacks, this is a singularly original, attractive, and strong work.